Okay. So here we go. So what we're looking at is what I learned from interviewing 65 visionary scientists from around the world. And they're amazing people. And um, what we're going to do specifically is look at the lessons that I learned from them, the practical applications, and then how to develop your clairvoyant and healing abilities as a application. And if you get interested, Mysteries of Reality is available, Mysteries of Knowledge Beyond Our Senses, and Mysteries of Healing. So to, in a nutshell, what I learned was that we're way more than we think we are. Minos Kafatos is a, a physicist who said we're way more than we think we are. And the trouble is that we live in a materialist paradigm time period where the dominant worldview is that the only thing that's real is what we can see and touch and understand with common sense. But the fact is there's a non-local dimension that allows for extraordinary abilities, which uh, are called psi, PSI. It's the Greek letter P, it stands for psyche. So we tend to think that our brain is the source of our information, but what psi research tells us that our brains are filters, transducers for the big universal mind and that our mind, our consciousness continues after death. Um, people like Eben Alexander, a famous surgeon, author, had an incredible near-death experience. And he, he writes about it in, in his books. And he used to be in the materialist paradigm, but discovered through his, his remembering all that he experienced on the other dimensions, even though his illness turned his brain to pus, he said, um, it, it, these kind of near-death experiences tell us that there's more than the little brain, that we have access to the mind. Um, in, in Hindu philosophy, for eons of times, they've talked about the Akashic records, that all information is stored and available to us. And that's how mediums like Edgar Casey can talk to us about our karmic patterns and our past life experiences that influences even our health issues here. So if common sense isn't the key issue that describes reality, what is? It's quantum mechanics. And all the quantum physicists of the 20th century said, it's weird, it's spooky. If it makes sense to you, you're not getting it. <laughs> so quantum mechanics, as you know, uh, explores the world of the tiny, the world of the atom and the molecule and the quark and the photon. And what, what we know about the universe is about 5% of it. Only about 5% is actually material. And the rest is uh, dark energy and dark matter, which scientists don't even really know what that is. So what happens is quantum, me quantum mechanics tells us that we have what's real is non-local, non-linear, non-time-based, reality and an example of that is if you it's called quantum non-locality so if you take two electrons and they become paired spinning around a common nucleus they become what physicists call entangled and if you take one and send it to another galaxy and you change its spin its partner instantaneously change its spin in response. 
So what this means is there's an information source that connects everything. And to me, this explains why we can do healing from a distance or mind over matter or clairvoyance or ESP and all those psi phenomena. So um, Dean Radin at the Institute of Noetic Sciences has done a lot of really exquisite research on these psi phenomena. And he says, um, psi involves consciousness from an unknown non-local source, which means it's everywhere, that can't be shielded, and it exists beyond space and time. And he found that our intention impacts matter. So he and Stephen Schwartz and others have done research where they'll have like Tibetan monks meditate on this half of tea or wine or chocolate and not the other half. And then they have people taste the wine, the chocolate, the tea, and the ones that were had the intention of being better were more fulfilling. So um, all what what we see is common sense that we're solid, that time is linear, that the future doesn't bleed into the present, that you can't influence the past. All of uh, the past, all of that is questioned by quantum mechanics. Um, so here's an example that spirit does continue it, it, that the materialist paradigm is inaccurate. Um, this is Corinne and her mother recently passed on and went to the other side and Corinne asked me to take a look at her, see how she was doing clairvoyantly. So when I looked at Corinne's mother, I saw her with a big white standard poodle sitting next to her. And when I conveyed that information to Corinne, she said, that's Sophie, our standard poodle. Mom used to watch her when we went out of town. She loved her. So Sophie is alive. I had no idea she existed, but somehow Corinne's mother created with her thought form, because we can do that on the other side, this image of Sophie, who was of great comfort to her. So, oops. Um, so better define this. So, as I said, we live in a world that believes, the science believes the only thing that's real is what you can see and touch and understand with your common sense. Uh, skeptics say, you flying pigs don't, Pigs don't fly, so it's there's no reason to even think about flying pigs. Um, so skeptics said they don't even want to look at the, the research about Psy. So Dean Radin says what's needed for a new paradigm is a more comprehensive model of reality where consciousness becomes just as fundamental, if not more so, than materialism. So it's the chicken or the egg. Materialists say material came and then consciousness, like our thinking abilities, followed from materialists, like atoms and molecules. But the psi focus is consciousness is undergirds everything. And consciousness is, is first. It's the, the ground of being and quantum mechanics would back that up. And this is not a new idea. Greek philosophers, idealists also uh, thought about consciousness and thought as the basis of reality. Um, in India, religions have long thought that this world is illusion, it's Maya, and that through meditation, um, people like uh, Oro Bindo and um, the author of uh, autobiography of a yogi um, develop cities which are places uh, powers like being two places at once or healing or clairvoyance or levitating or that kind of thing so for for decades in the east people have understood the kind of the basics of the consciousness paradigm and quantum mechanics 
So obviously the question is, well, how do you define consciousness? And the scientists that I interviewed for the trilogy said, it's not easy. Whenever I say, well, how do you define consciousness? They'd all say, oh, <laughs> that, that's, that's a difficult task. But they used words like one mind, spirit, energy, the force, as in the Star Wars movies, matrix, hologram, meaning fields, biofield, cosmic intelligence, information. Information comes up a lot. Panpsychism, non-local beyond space and time, a substrate, non-physical web, spiritual computer, fifth dimension. And this kind of world of consciousness beyond matter um, speaks to us in mathematics and patterns like fractals. Um, what's interesting to me is that being in the vanguard of a changing paradigm is not easy. And we know that like Galileo who said the sun is really the center of the, the solar system were severely punished uh, for saying that, put in jail and whatever. So it's not easy to be, a, 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 to question the dominant paradigm. So I was really interesting interested in what gave them the courage to be the questioners, the, the vanguard. And um, people like Brian Josephson, who's a PhD physicist um, who won the Nobel Prize for physics when he was a young man for discovering quantum tunneling, he, he reported that in his university at Cambridge that um, that the students are encouraged not to work with him. The other faculty don't work with Josephson. And so his research has been really held back by the lack of um, people power, student power to, to help him in his work. So what, what makes these people courageous? Um, okay, they're, they're obviously well-educated, did well in school. Um, I interview people from the US, Canada, the UK, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands. Um, what's sad for the future of Psy research is most of them are older white men. Um, John Kruth was considered a youngster at 48 when he started leadership at the Rhine Research Center. Um, only two of the 65 are people of color, only 18 are women and I really tried. <laughs> Um, uh, as usual, women who have a demanding careers um, have fewer children than the average. Um, they, these 18 women had 16 children between them. Um, and a lot of the scientists advised young people who are interested, young scholars who are interested in sci research to wait until they had tenure or were established because there's a lot of prejudice against it. It's considered woo-woo and not scientific. Uh, we need to have sci courses in universities and the UK is way ahead of the US in doing that. We do have uh, like um, Gary Schwartz at the University of Arizona who's doing all kinds of interesting research in mediums and angels and whatever, um, but that's, that's unusual. So there needs to be support for these kind of courses and uh, research from young people. Um, they, a lot of them, the, the these visionary scientists describe themselves as curious. Um, a, a lot of them were musicians like Dean Radin is a violinist. Um, Larry Dossey, who's done a lot of research on the efficacy of prayer, said it takes a rabble rouser to actually develop the courage to take on the establishment. Uh, so what makes a rabble rouser, I wanted to know. Um, they were more likely to be firstborn, 35 compared to 26 later born, because uh, firstborns get encouragement to achieve. Um, a lot of them 
had their own experiences of psi or their family members did, usually their mothers, sisters, uh, female relatives. So they, they, they knew people who had these kind of um, insights. Uh, for people who are interested in astrology, um, they were more likely to be Sagittarius who are known to be adventurous and exploratory and Aquarius are visionary thinkers, if you want to follow the stereotypes. Um, Libras look for justice and balance. If you're interested in the Myers-Briggs, Kiersey and Bates personality inventory, they tend to be extroverted, intuitive, feeling, and judging. And most bench researchers tend to be sensing and thinking. So these, these people were highly intuitive compared to the norm for scientists. So that, that's a big factor. And I don't know which came first, their in, intuitive characteristic or their experiences, which made them interested. So the next topic we're looking at is, so what can you do with all this? If there is this non-local world beyond space and time, beyond our common sense, explained by quantum mechanics, um, what, what can we do with it? Well, as we started out, it tells us that we have abilities, access to power, information, healing, insights, precognition, that materialist paradigm would say, oh, you don't have that. So Chris Rose, a, a British scientist, he says our current psychological model of what it is to be a human being is incomplete. And we have all kinds of evidence that the mind has a lot of power and we need to teach kids and everyone how to focus the mind for positive results. Um, so evidence of the power of mind is everybody knows about the placebo effect that even if you know you're being given uh, a little sugar peel it can uh, make you have positive effects in terms of your healing as Ted Kapachuk is discovering at Harvard in his research on placebo. Um, the Institute of Noetic Science has collected all kinds of data about spontaneous remission where someone has uh, stage four cancer and remits. Um, and a book called Cure by a physician um, also explores this phenomena. And what, what he found is that the remission occurs when someone changes their sense of themselves, their identity. And that kind of ties into disassociative identity disorder and it used to be called multiple personalities. So what DDI studies show us is one of the multiple personalities can be allergic to this medication and not the other. One could wear glasses and the other not need it. One could have diabetes and the other not. To me, that's really profound that the personality totally changes the the, the health system of the body. That, in a way, that's all we need to know to, to lead to the conclusion that integrative complementary medicine is, is the wave of the future. Um, there's been lots of studies on the power of prayer where anonymous groups pray for people who are in hospital who have had recent heart attacks and get better outcomes. Bill Bankston is a sociologist uh, uh, who works with uh, statistics and that kind of thing at a university in the East Coast. He's doing the most amazing research in healing. And what he does is inject mice with breast cancer and he does a cure and they are healed. And they, they develop tumors, that heal themselves and they live their normal little two-year life mice 
longevity. And what he found is that it's he all only picks healers to put their hands around the cage of the mice who are skeptics. He doesn't want to deal with anybody who thinks they're a healer. And he did find that students, like biology students, who were embarrassed about sitting with their hands around the cage of mice doing healing work, they didn't get effect, positive effect on their mice. Um, so the intent of the healer does have something to do with it. But what he's found is that he can capture the frequency of the healing of his experienced healers working on these diseased mice and record it. And he hopes to use that, the recording of frequency that we can't even hear to heal. And he, he has healers working on his method around the world. And they of course work on human beings too. So he's a tennis player. He's injured his leg muscles. He charges cotton with his healing method, which involves cycling positive intentions of things he wants. So you think, okay, I want a thumb drive. I want a Porsche. I want this and that, like 20 things and you just recycle it. But I want this, I want this. And um, he uses that as his healing method. The, the Ryan Institute is doing that as using his method as well and, and getting results. And he's working on getting replication in uh, labs like in Japan, but it, he's doing amazing work. Um, we know that if the hypnotherapist tells the person on the stage, I am taking this pen, but it's really a cigarette and I'm putting the cigarette on your skin, the skin will blister. Um, even though it's only a pen, not, not a cigarette. Um, so uh, people are working on the biofield with tuning forks and getting healing results like Shimani Jane at, at, at Chi. And um, people are doing, uh, working with meridians and uh, chakras to do all kinds of healing work, um, best known as energy, uh, emotional uh, freedom technique, part of energy psychology tapping. Um, so all, all of this that, we, that I've just mentioned indicates that our minds are very powerful and we need to learn to use them to get the kind of positive results that we want. Ayurveda is um, Indian system of, of healing that looks at different kind of typologies in the body. Um, okay, another application is we can get information and guidance through accessing our intuition, ESP, dreams. One of my scientists does dream circles where they um, focus on one, purpose, one person and see what they dream about that person. Um, meditation, we know, has all kinds of positive effects on mental health and physical health. And um, it's easy just to focus on your breathing to quiet the mind. I'd say quiet the brain. Um, and we can get uh, there what near-death experiences and mediums and uh, other kinds of access to other worlds show us is we can get guidance from spirit guides and um, our, our helpful spirits. So it opens up a whole world of support and information. Um, as uh, even Alexander explained after his near-death experience in his books. Um, another application is resolving grief. Um, Marilyn Schlitz and Christine Simmons Moore, who's a professor in Georgia, have a, a machine called a psychomantium that allows the person to feel like they have contact with a recent departed loved one and they can work through their grief with this kind of contact. Um, 
in Italy, Patrizio Trisoldi, and in Utah, I mean, in, in Colorado, Garrett Modell are working with devices that respond to intention. So if you have a, a leg that's disabled, you could use this device and think walk forward, walk backwards, walk to this side. And Trisoldi is working on devices around your household so that you could think uh, lights on or whatever it is. Um, agriculture, another application of Psy. In the UK, Serena Rooney Dougal did research where um, seeds are prayed over or not, and the ones that had the positive intention were healthier, grew more, and were less likely to get diseases. So maybe in the future, farmers will routinely bless their seeds before planting them. Um, because we have this other realm, it can answer cosmological questions like what is dark matter? Um, Rupert Sheldrake is known for his morphic resonance fields of how memories are stored. Um, Excuse me, you have to go outside, no barking. And um, it, it, it can prepare us for the future with doing remote viewing. Um, Jude Curvan is a physicist and businesswoman who um, is interested in how we can shape future organizations using principles drawn from Psi. Um, people like Russell Targ, a remote viewer, Stephen Schwartz, a remote viewer, Garrett Modell have done research where they remote view the commodities market, like silver, and they've made thousands of dollars. So if you, they're very practical applications of science. Um, another application is the, Besides the climate crisis, the, the crisis that most concerns me is youth mental health. And a 2023 CDC report on youth risk behavior in the US um, found that 57% of high school girls felt persistent sadness or hopelessness in 2021. And that was double the 29% for boys. One in three girls had seriously considered suicide and 13 had attempted it. Young people are telling us that they are in crisis, concluded the researcher, Dr. Kathleen Ethler. So the question is why the rise? Um, well, obviously mental health problems went up for all kinds of age groups during COVID due to the isolation. And the major focus seems to be on the harms of social media. But what my interviews with global youth point to is not so much social media as pressure to succeed in a really competitive, difficult economic and political environment and worry about the planetary future. They're worried that, that they're not gonna make it. Why should I have children and bring them into this decaying, crumbling world? Um, I have resources for parents and kids and how you can use Psy principles. They're on my website and excuse me, and in my book, Calm Parents and Children, a guidebook, if this is an issue that you're interested in as well. Um, okay, our third category is how do you do clairvoyant reading? I'm using that as an application for the consciousness paradigm. And I explain it in my book, Essential Energy Tools, how to develop your clairvoyant and healing abilities if you want to go further with this. But um, it, what everyone emphasizes is that the preliminary to doing uh, intuitive or healing work is meditation because that turns off the chattering left brain, blah, 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 the monkey mind. And we need to be in a whole brain, a, a kind of receptive space 
to do intuitive and, and healing work. So meditation is the template for healing, the preparation for, for reading. And then I also think a, a basic preparation is to record and analyze your dreams because the language of dreams is symbolic um, in, in, in the same way as doing clairvoyant reading is. Um, so it, it can take months of writing down your dreams before you figure out patterns. So I know when I first started writing them down after going to a conference on Jung, um, I had a pattern of anxiety about being asked to teach math. And I said, okay, I'll try, I'll work with my good students, we'll do it as a group effort. And, but after three or four months, I finally said, no, I'll teach anything in social science, but not math. So it was an exercise that my unconscious was doing in um, being assertive and saying no to an unreasonable request. So um, it, it took months for me to come to the point of where I could say no. So again, I suggest you write down your dreams. This is the running energy meditation that we'll do to prepare to actually read. So I'm gonna go through and do the kind of um, logical principles and then we'll actually do it. Um, it's really important to read from the sixth chakra. So we use an image of a room in the center of the head, which I'll go through in order to align with the sixth chakra because it's neutral and clear seeing. Um, it's really important to be grounded. So we'll do a grounding meditation. It's important to be bilateral rather than homolateral. And what I mean by that is uh, brain gym, G-Y-M, and energy medicine um, have found that if you get stressed and traumatized, you become homolateral, which means you're aligned right brain, right side of the body, left brain, left side of the body. Whereas a healthy body is the right brain is aligned with left side, left with right side. And the question is, well, how do you do that? And the answer is, anything that crosses the midline, like cross crawling. So it's a good idea to do some cross crawls, meditate, ground, before you do anything reading or healing. If emotions come up when you're reading someone, it indicates you've dropped down to the caring, loving heart chakra or the feeling second chakra. And we don't wanna read from those chakras because they're not, neutral. Um, when you do reading, put up energetic protection um, so you can visualize uh, like a field of roses all the way around you or a rainbow bubble of light, the light of truth. And what I've discovered is the key to doing clairvoyant reading is to ask questions. What, what, what image do I see? Why do I see that? What color is that? What, what else can I learn from that? And then that keeps your brain working as a whole rather than the left brain taking over. And when we do reading, it's just passive. We don't try to heal, so we separate. Okay, I'm just looking, receiving the images or the sound or whatever it is. And then we can say, okay, let's, let's correct this. And when you're doing clairvoyant reading, it really helps to know your emotional issues. Um, and it, I really emphasize that all my students, we take a lot of personality inventories like the Myers-Briggs, shortened by Kiersey and Bates in their book, Please Understand Me, to know your biases. Um, and it really helps to know your represent representational system that is, how do you access information? Are you visual, auditory, kinesthetic, or auditory digital? Uh, so it's, it's easier to get images visually because there's a lot of cues. Um, I test auditory, digital, and kinesthetic. So an example of that is I was snorkeling off of an island off in Puerto Rico 
and I was just going through the snorkeling along. It was boring, just seeing seaweed. So I asked my guides, I said, this is boring. Please send me something interesting to look at. And within seconds, three big dolphins came up. Boom, boom, boom. And an, a visual person would have really focused on, oh, what's their color? What's their shape? An auditory person would have listened. Are they beep, beeping or whatever dolphins do? But um, as auditory digital, they run everything through words in their brains. So I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm, these dolphins came. This is so great. I'll be able to tell people about my experience with the dolphins in Puerto Rico. Um, and kinesthetic people feel in their bodies, auditory, hear sounds. So we can use all these senses, but it's easier to use visual and you can do that even if you're not primarily a visual person. And I do wanna say it's important after you do any reading or healing to separate from your reedy or your healy. And a really easy way to do it is just snap your fingers with the intent of separating. Um, it's hard to get information without a template. And so um, templates that Lewis Bostwick developed is the rose, like the roots are how grounded the person is, the stem is how many past lives, the leaves are children they intend to have. You can get a lot of looking at how healthy is the rose, what stage is it in, is it bloomed, is it uh, like I was looking at someone who was a drug addict and it had like a like a big patch kind of torn out of out of the rose, that kind of thing. Um, David Furlong is a British clairvoyant, and he suggests doing a reading, looking at the person as a castle. Um, how much water is in the moat? Is the drawbridge up? Um, how good repair is the castle in? What's going on with the king and queen, the, the people who live in the castle? Or we can um, look at a person as a car. How good, how good repair? How's the engine doing? Where are they going? Who are the passengers? Um, for me, um, I e evolved from Louis Bostwick's techniques at the Berkeley Psychic Institute to just asking for a, a, a reading clip. Um, you can imagine, you can try doing remote viewing. So I have something in this bag and um, you can try to remote view it. The remote viewers were often artistic and uh, they, they used a pen and pencil uh, to draw and they focus on that. Um, so if you want to try this, draw and see what comes up for you and I'll show, show it to you later. And you look for something that isn't something you would usually see or draw. Um, Charles Tart tried this when he was getting to know the remote viewers in the Bay Area and they went to a, a, a laundry, you know, laundromat. And so he drew these, you know, white metal circles going round and round. And, um, and so he, he was amazed that he was able to remote view these washing machines. Um, this is Paul Smith and um, he, he's a kinesthetic. So he was working for the military and they asked him to locate a shipment of drugs on a, on a big liner, big ship. And so as a kinesthetic, he said, um, I slid a ruler across until I felt a tingle, drew a line. Then I slid the ruler in another direction, felt a tingle, drew a line. Somewhere in the proximity of that intersection is where I found the contraband would be, is where I predicted the contraband would be found, and it was. So the, um, the US government, in the Stargate program, paid remote viewers like him to uh, remote view Soviet uh, missile submarine activity. They were amazing. 
locate a U.S. ship. Um, in terms of healing principles, the Native Americans, indigenous people say the healer should be a hollow bone. So you bring healing energy through you. You're a channel for healing energy. It may be Reiki or Joe Ray or a rainbow of healing light, whatever your training or interest. Um, so Chief Luther Standing Bear, a Sioux, said, if we are to become a channel for the creator's purposes, we must prepare ourselves to do so. If we have resentment, fear, selfishness, or anger, we're not hollow bones. Only when we are hollow bones can we have an effect on the world. I think that's really profound advice for healers. Um, so once you've done a reading, you identify an issue that needs to be balanced out, what kind of healing tools are available? Um, intention is a main one, visualization. Um, Cindy Dale talks about uh, streams of grace. Um, your hands, sending energy through your hands, um, working with symbols as Reiki practitioners do. Um, or, you know, sending things like a cross or a figure eight, I use a lot for balancing. Um, colors are healing, sounds are healing, calling on spiritual icons like Angel Michael or Mother Mary, Kuan Yin, um, doing acupressure tapping. And the research is coming in really strongly that it's very efficacious. They've done a lot of research on using emotional freedom technique to deal with um, PTSD like, like in vets. So it's, it's easy to do and, and really effective. Um, so here are some resources if you wanna follow up. Okay. Um, so let's, I'm going to turn off the recording. Turn off my recording as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I think I got it. Okay. So how, how long was that? I have no idea. Um, I think it was about 45 minutes. Okay. Because then what I'm going to do is, is actually do reading. And, right. Uh, right. And I figured, you know, take questions and stuff. And as well. questions. And, yeah. Okay. All right, um, I'm, I'm ready for the critique. Okay, so I would say, you know, at the beginning, I'm not sure how, how well these people, you know, know about you or about your, you know, your past work or where you're they at. Don't. They don't. Um, so then I would say definitely, if not a whole slide by itself, um, you know, just take 30 seconds or a minute at the beginning just to introduce yourself, um, your credentials, you know, your history, and kind of even what you do now with like the, you know, energy center readings that you do with the, you know, on Wednesdays and that kind of thing. Um, right. right. You know, so then there's just like some more background around who you are and what you do. Um, and then I think kind of on a few slides, um, specifically the consciousness versus materialist slide, um, the defining consciousness slide and the leading the vanguard slide. Um, I would say try and, you know, they're kind of in like a paragraph format. Um, I would say try and take the information on those and like bullet point it out, right? In shorter sentences, because okay. I, I know some of them were bullet points, but then it'd be like a long sentence. Okay. So even Great. if you need to, uh, you know, even if you need to extend it over like a slide or two and move forward with the slide. Um, you know, I think that would help people follow because there were a few points where, you know, there's just so much information on the slide. Um, there were a few points where I would get kind of lost on like where we were supposed to be looking at on the PowerPoint, through, you know, as you were speaking. Right. Um, so having that adjustment and then, you know, specifically, I think for the um yeah for the practical applications slide 
Yeah. Um, I think that was the main one where it could definitely be extended into a few PowerPoints. Okay. Um, and, you know, and then, cause it's like, you've got that whole list where it talks about, um, you know, like, you know, the different, you know, it's like just commas, you know, in that first block paragraph, it's like this method, comma, this method, comma, this method, yeah. comma, this method. Oh, and yeah. Then, yeah. And then you go into detail speaking about all of them, which was really good. And I like what you said. Um, but I would say just break that up a bit more. So it's like, okay, so now we're talking about this method. And then now we're moving down the PowerPoint to this method, you know, and then I think that would help people, you know, and give like maybe give a short point about whatever it is you're going to talk about about that method. Okay. This is very uh, useful, Ian. I really am very grateful. Yeah, of course. Um, but I mean, those were the main things, I think. Um, you know, I liked the points you made and the things that you said. Um, I think just kind of adjusting a few of those slides from that paragraph format into a bit more spaced out where it's like point by point by point that you're going to make would be good because you have the information in, you know, chronological order about what you're going to talk about. So I think it's just kind of expanding it out and like letting it take more space. And I would say, don't worry about having, you know, more slides, right? Because it's just a click to get to the next one. Yeah. Um, and then I don't know what, like it, how, what level of, you know, if you want to just do your presentation and then do readings and have a conversation after. Um, or I was thinking of doing questions after each of the sections. Right. So then I would say, um, you know, then either add a little bullet point on the slide or say throughout the question or say throughout the presentation, like, OK, so before we move on to the next point, you know, or before we move on to the next category, um, did anybody have any quick questions that we can go over while we're on the topic? Because I, I do agree, I think that would be better just because the information is, you know, pretty dense. And I think a lot of questions would kind of get lost throughout the process. Um, so I'd recommend just adding a little bullet point at the end of all your bullet points or just being like, okay, and so before we move on to the next, you know, little section here, does anybody have any questions? And I would say, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, I would say pre-establish that before you go into the presentation. Okay. Uh, you know, so then you know exactly which parts we're going to take and we're going to pause and we're going to ask if there's any questions. Okay. Uh, but that's pretty much it. Um, that's great. Yeah. Did you I learn think, anything or did you know it all? Yeah, I learned a few things. Yeah, I, I had heard most of it, you know, just because I've kind of been around, you know, with, with your, you know, learning for a while. Mm -hmm. um but I, I think I did learn a th few things I was more focused on trying to make sure the you know trying to see if there's anything I would critique or adjust um can you show me the puppy with your laptop um I, he's he's not around right now he's in his uh, parents bedroom <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, but I'll uh, I'll take some photos and I'll uh, send it uh, I'll email them to you or right, and the next time if he's around you could show us Mm -hmm. yeah sounds good yeah <laughs> he seems to be uh, important for you it's interesting yeah I've been uh, hanging out with him he's a good little guy <laughs> um well and I just want to say I'm I'm so happy you're being in the class every time now it really it's a great addition it's wonderful to, to have you I appreciate it yeah of course yeah I'm happy to be there it's definitely something that's important to me um so it's worth uh you know taking the whatever two hours off a little early work you know once every two weeks to to participate so glad to be back into it and you know definitely worth putting in the effort to make sure i'm there yeah good it's really awesome. smart to do it now you know while you're young and your life is ahead of you it's great to right. yeah mm -hmm. yeah good skills to be developing Okay. Um, okay. So I would say, yeah, I would say make those changes. If you do want, you know, once you go through and break down those paragraphs, um, if you do 